So, our first plenary session has the title Food Systems for Health. The goal of this session is to achieve a common understanding of the current state of our global food system and its impact on our health, as well as the transformation needed to secure safe and healthy diets for all. So, to start, we will listen to Dr. Francesco Branca. Uh, Francesco is the Director of Department Nutrition and Food Safety at WHO in Geneva. Warmly welcome, Francesco. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to the Uppsala Health Summit uh, for, first of all, for selecting this, this topic. Uh, this is absolutely critical at this uh, um, contingence in uh, the humankind. Uh, but thank you for uh, allowing me to be in this fantastic venue. I, I realize that that's an historical value where uh, your queen. Uh, Christine decided to give up, and I think it's an important side because you know I think we need to decide when to give up when time is ripe. Um, so I would like to start uh, by um, telling you that um, w this summit is about really solutions, and I think it's important to discuss about solutions. But in order to find the right solutions, we need to frame the issues in the right way. And I'd like to frame it in a comprehensive way. So what is the connection between food and health? And on the right side of this slide, you see a number of health conditions which are connected to somehow food. And some of them are obvious, of course, the different forms of malnutrition, the uh, impact of unhealthy diet, non-communicable diseases, but also communicable diseases, uh, and a number of others, including mental illness and certain poisonings. And, and you see there are a number of pathways. There are multiple pathways of interaction, but we've summarized in five pathways. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about each one of them. So first one is unhealthy diet and malnutrition and food insecurity. Second one is uh, about uh, uh, zoonotic diseases and antimicrobial resistance. The third one is unsafe and adulterated food. The fourth one is environmental contamination and degradation. The fifth one is occupational hazard. So let me start with the, with the first one. You're probably familiar with the global burden of disease. Uh, it, you actually have to go on a website and, and do the analysis. It changes every once in a while because demography changes, some of the impact sizes change, but you know, this is sort of the latest one. You see that unhealthy diet accounts for 8 million deaths every year, followed by obesity, which accounts for uh, additional 5 million deaths, and then maternal and child malnutrition, 3 million deaths. If you put them all together, it's a third of the overall mortality. So it's actually a major component of uh, uh, the world mortality, largely due to non-communicable diseases, but a lot of them are also due to infectious diseases. Now, I was saying um, different forms of malnutrition. We, we are now aware that uh, uh, there's not a single form of malnutrition. Even the Sustainable Development Goals talk about this uh, uh, all forms of malnutrition. What do we mean by that? We certainly mean that there are um, some forms of undernutrition, particularly uh, wasting, stunting, which still affect large amounts of population. This is children under five, so we have um, about 150 million children still affected by stunting, uh, about 45 million children still affected by wasting, but then you already have, in that very early age, uh, overweight and obesity, and of course, uh, obesity in, in the adult population, as well as uh, different forms of uh, macronutrient deficiencies. There was just a, a new estimate of the macronutrient deficiencies indicating that two billion people in the world are affected. But we use anemia uh, in women of reproductive age as a marker of this, and you see, uh, you know, about ha uh, 264 million uh, women affected uh, by uh, the uh, iron deficiency anemia. And then 
this is a terrible year for food insecurity. I mean, this is the latest report that uh, um, uh, we published together with the sister agencies, FAO, World Food Program, IFAD, and UNICEF, and it's telling about the state of food security and nutrition in the world. This is a terrible year. I mean, you see the U-shaped curve. It's going up again. We had done progress in reducing food insecurity. Now it's going up again. We have about 800 million, you know, some estimates up to 828 million people who don't have enough energy to it. And this is just about, only about the energy. That means one person in 10, 10% 10 of people affected by food insecurity. It's a convergence of factors. It's climate change, which reduces production. It's uh, the economic downturns. Uh, it's the um, result of the pandemic of COVID. And now the conflict and the war in Ukraine, and we estimate that additional 11 million people in the world will be affected by food insecurity as a result of the war. The other pathway I, t I told you, uh, actually number three, but uh, it's, it's about uh, food safety and adulterated foods. And it's not a small number of people every year who are affected uh, by some forms of food contamination. A lot of it is about diarrheal disease and, uh, you know, Campylobacter, Salmonella, those are the key ones. But we calculate that about one people in ten gets ill every year by some um, contamination of the food. And that leads to uh, 420,000 deaths, particularly among young children, 125,000 deaths in children under five, largely to do diarrheal diseases. And can you imagine where, where these kind of conditions are most common, where you know, we cannot uh, uh, use safe water to clean food, and when the uh, food really um, doesn't go through the right uh, screening process uh, and without uh, having good food control systems. Then I was telling you about the zoonosis and the antimicrobial resistance. Why is this important? We've, we've learned the hard way how uh, infectious diseases can cause uh, uh, worldwide tragedies. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic is most likely a zoonosis. It means it's a disease that is transmitted by some animals, and we know that uh, coronaviruses are found in bats and to humans. Now, we're not quite clear how this uh, uh, jump in species happened, which was the amplification species, but we certainly have a suspicion that uh, somehow the food system is, is part of the story. As it's been part of the story in 75% of the infectious diseases we've had in the last 20 years, and that's because humans are encroaching in the environment uh, of, uh, of these uh, species that are uh, a tank of the, of the different uh, infectious diseases. We are clearing land, which we shouldn't be clearing. We are you know, creating, expanding our uh, land for growing uh, through deforestation. Uh, we are uh, building uh, roads, mines, increasing our cities. Uh, but also, we're using the wildlife in different ways. We have uh, trades of wildlife species. We use, uh, we kill uh, wildlife in traditional food markets in an unsafe way. And also, in, in uh, uh, high-income countries, we use intensive farming practices, uh, which are also associated uh, to uh, increase zoonotic diseases. Antimicrobial resistance uh, comes as a result of excess use of antibiotics. And 75% of the world antibiotics are actually um, due to the, its use in uh, um, intensive livestock farming, livestock and actually poultry farming uh, as, as well. And what happens? I mean, these antibiotics uh, get washed in the environment, and, and, and antimicrobial resistance is very common in the animals themselves, in the workers, and then in the uh, overall population. And this is due to very variable practices. Uh, I was actually quite interested to see that, for example, in Sweden, in the green one is the use of antimicrobials in, in animal farming and blue in humans. In Sweden, you're actually very good because the use of antibiotics, a bit down the line here, the, the, the third but last, uh, is, is very low. And if you compare with other countries like Italy, Spain, or Cyprus, uh, there's a much greater use of antimicrobial. 
The other uh, important area is the environmental contamination caused uh, by food system. In particular, I'd like to emphasize the use of, um, um, of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, um, in uh, um, fertilizers. And you know, this goes away in water. It actually creates also important environmental impact called eutrophication. So you have a growth, an overgrowth of algae in waters, and that has an, eff an effect on, on fish, for example. But then the exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals, particularly organophosphatic pesticides heavy metal contamination, nitrogen-based air pollution, and then, you know, the big issue of uh, production of CO2. And here, I'd like to spend a little bit more time. There's been a very interesting report, which I, if you've not already read, I invite you to read, produced by Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2019, uh, really talking about this bi-directional uh, relation between food system and climate change. I'm sure that Patrizia will tell you more about uh, some of these impacts. But just here to say that, of course, climate change is producing an impact on food insecurity. But the way we eat, and now I think, you know, we all know that, but uh, uh, we still have not uh, changed our way of life to reduce this impact of the food system on climate change, which is, which is an impact particularly on the greenhouse gas emissions, but is also in general an impact on the way the resources are used. Uh, the greenhouse gas emissions are only second of the food system, are only second to the one of the energy system. You know, about 24 percent, varying to the, 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 according to the estimates, but let's say between one-fourth and one-third of the greenhouse gas emissions, whereas agriculture can actually be a solution to this problem. So, that's the first one. But then the other one is the use of water. We're using the, uh, agri uh, the system, food system uses uh, about uh, two-thirds um, of, uh, of fresh water. And then it uses a lot of land. It uses one-third of the land. If we continue with the current diet, we will not be able to feed the whole world, the whole 10 billion people that we will be in 2050, because we will exceed all these planetary boundaries we will exceed the acceptable limit of greenhouse gas emissions. We will exceed the acceptable limits uh, of cropland use, uh, freshwater use, and nitrogen and phosphor applications. So uh, this is really a sign that uh, a, a drastic, dramatic food system transformation is required. And then the last pathway is health of food workers. And let's not forget about that. I mean, these are numbers which are calculated by a beautiful report, which I also invite you to read, 2017 report by IPES Food. And the calculation was that about 170,000 deaths every year uh, take place in the, in the um, agricultural system and about 24,000 deaths in, in the fishes. About 200,000 workers die every year as a result of unsafe uh, uh, food conditions and you know, you have a list there, acute pesticide poisoning, uh, uh, again, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, uh, uh, other kinds of airborne substances, zoonotic diseases, antimicrobial resistance, uh, risks uh, due to injuries uh, uh, during the food processing distribution and uh, the collection of, uh, let alone uh, the stressful mental health conditions. Now, this is about summit. This summit is about uh, solutions. Uh, it, do we have do we have solutions there? And, and the answer is definitely yes. There are solutions. I mean, the same way we have created the problem, we can have solutions. But these solutions uh, need to, to be found in in multiple. Uh, leverages in the society, I mean, the governance and the policy being the key one. So this is, this is about, of course, our own individual changes. This is about uh, adopting a healthy and sustainable diet, but it's about uh, changes in the governance. And it's about developing a completely new uh, idea of how a food system can be structured and can work. These solutions need to be found across the different spectrum of the food system. So in the food supply chain, in the food environment, and in the consumer behavior. And we do have a number of important policies that can be used. I mean, in the 
a food supply path. Just as an example, and again, please read uh, to this year's report of the State of Food Security and Nutrition that uh, gives a very detailed analysis of the kind of investment that is done in subsidies. $600 billion investment done in different forms of subsidies, they can be reoriented towards a more sustainable food system. But then policies in the food environment and then policies at the consumer's level. And um, at the heart of it is a concept, the concept of a sustainable healthy diet. And you know, this is the definition that um, FAO and WHO have given recently. Uh, Sustainable health diets are dietary patterns that promote all dimensions of individual's health and well-being. So health, of course, comes first. Uh, of low environmental pressure and impact are accessible, affordable, safe and equitable and are culturally acceptable. So there is this element of society. I think this meeting will discuss uh, a lot about society's inequity of, of access. We don't have equity of access. 3.1 billion people in the world cannot afford a healthy diet. Uh, now, what does it mean in concrete? I mean, this is a very interesting example, which has been uh, you know, a lot discussed, but it's, it's a very concrete, useful example on what a sustainable, healthy diet can mean in practice. And it, it's, it's something that all cultures in the world can adopt. You know, basically, it's uh, you know, reducing the consumption of animal source food, but in a way that still covers the need. And we do have certain parts of the world, as I'm sure Namukolo will tell you, that actually do need even more animal, animal source food. So it's a balanced way of consumption of animal source food. Uh, do we have um, actions? And uh, this is a list of uh, policies that uh, WHO recommends in the context uh, of uh, you know, the food system transformation. First of all, reformulating uh, products and having less salt, less sugars, uh, um, eliminating uh, trans fat, uh, having healthier fats and having more nutritious food. Second is getting the price right uh, and uh, um, increasing the price of unhealthy food items, for example, through taxation of sugar sweetened beverages, but also providing the subsidies that would allow, for example, fruit and vegetables to be more affordable to more. Third, perhaps, you know, really this is an incredible area for, for development, is public food procurement, getting the right food on the tables of children in school, of uh, people working in uh, public canteens, in the army, in the hospitals, which would not only benefit those who eat those foods, but the whole uh, supply system that will actually encourage the production of healthier foods. Uh, we eat a lot of processed food. In certain countries, up to 60% of the food we eat is actually processed and packaged, having a clear system that everybody can understand on those packages is a very important thing to do. Front of the pack labeling. Uh, micronutrients, if there's two billion people with micronutrient deficiencies, actually we need to get back some of the micronutrients in the food system. We've used fortification for a number of years. You know, this is the time now to make fortification adequate, uh, appropriate, and really to be uh, added to um, all staple foods. Last but not least, avoiding that there is a misalignment between the marketing pressure uh, and the dietary guidelines. So, so we should not allow uh, that products that are, should be consumed less to be heavily marketed, uh, to, particularly to children. Uh, food safety. Uh, there is a good strategy for food safety that uh, WHO has developed. Basically, this is about having food control systems uh, everywhere. Um, and I'd like to close uh, by saying, by reminding us that um, uh, last year, the UN Secretary General convened a UN food system summit, in, and the summit was, was concluded that, you know, these are the dimensions of change of the food uh, systems, uh, nourishing all people, uh, boosting nature-based solutions, uh, equitable livelihoods, resilience uh, in, uh, to shocks and stresses, accelerating the means of implementation. And uh, many partners have come together to try and, and do this. Uh, we have created these uh, alliances and coalitions, and there's one coalition that Sweden is actually part of, 
a coalition for action on healthy diets from sustainable a food system for children and all, where the objective is really to um, join forces, exchange experiences, uh, um, promote action and investment in these action areas, food supply, food environment, valuing food. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, the promise for the future, and I hope that a, a meeting like this today will uh, allow us to have more ideas and uh, more uh, energy to work on this very important task. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very great overview and, and your presentation. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask, just, so would you say, it, it, is it even reasonable to separate health issues that come from sort of typical um, I, I, this is a new question. We didn't talk about this. <laughs> but, but I think sometimes we separate. In our society, we separate things. So it's like medical issues is something, and environmental issues is something else. But from your presentation, I feel like this separation is actually not uh, functional. Uh, we have been using a concept uh, of One Health uh, since uh, probably a couple of centuries without really mainstreaming it. And I think you know, maybe as a result of the pandemic, we have understood that unless there is a full uh, understanding of uh, the interaction between the health of humans, uh, that of animals and that of the planet, uh, we're not going to solve the problem. So absolutely, uh, this, is, this is absolutely required. Uh, we cannot protect the health of humans without protect, protecting the, the health of, of the other beings, uh, live beings in, in, in the planet. Uh, it, it, there is a circular relationship. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. I think we will leave it at that. You will here all the time, so there's plenty of time to also interact, and you will be part of one of the workshops as well. Yes. So. Thank you very much. Thank you.